exciting project um, that is related to getting light into algae cultures. Um, now algae cultures, uh, I wasn't aware of this until about two or three years ago, are fascinating because you can create a lot of biomass with algae, which are very simple organisms, that produce uh, a lot of lipids very efficiently. These lipids are sought after for biofuel generation. If you do it with algae, you don't have to do it with land-based crops, so you don't take away space from, from food crops uh, that you might need. You also, with algae, have less constraints on the supply of fresh water. Uh, you create less wastewater, and as a matter of fact, algae can actually reduce some of the wastewater that we have by sort of breaking it down. And algae can capture carbon dioxide. So it's a neat little sort of system that does it all to some extent. Right? But the, the focus that, that we have is creating biomass from algae. And that, as I study this more and more, seems to have one problem, and that is that algae are needing light. They're phototropic cultures, autotropic if you want. Uh, they need light and carbon dioxide. And uh, if you have a, a pot of algae, often these are sitting in these raceway ponds that are about 30 centimeters deep. The problem is that as light propagates through the algae, the top algae eat up all the light, and then the, the bottom is shaded. It's called self shaded and so what people do in, in sort of more large-scale algae cultures uh, is to churn these large water masses over and over to uh, prevent the bottom layer of the algae to, to sort of, sort of starve from light and carbon dioxide. And that churning, depending on the system and depending on, on, on the, um, sort of the, the way how the algae are cultured, uh, can be between 20 uh, up to some numbers I've seen as extreme as 80% of all the sort of cost in the algae manufacturing. Now, these numbers come from different applications. Uh, I think somebody has to be careful about exactly placing placing and spilling value there. But I think that if uh, you wouldn't have to churn the water, you can significantly reduce energy and reduce the cost associated with this energy. And so hopefully, there's a factor of two or maybe even five in there in terms of energy reduction if you would find a way to keep the algae more calm. And the way how we think you can keep the algae more calm is to bring the light to the algae. Not bring the algae to the light, but do it the other way around. And we work with these uh, fibers, where we structure the cladding of the fibers to emit light in a homogeneous fashion, fashion as light travels down the fiber. And we think we can also form the core of the fibers uh, in a fashion that we can translate the carbon dioxide up or down to the algae and this pure air distributes it homogeneously. In that way, we wouldn't have to churn the water around so much, and hopefully we would still have um, the same efficiency of creating algae, or maybe even being able to go into deeper ponds and that would allow us to, to then produce more mass of algae at the same surface area. Yeah. So now uh, we are in the lab, we do this in small scale reactors. Um, we are working on starting collaborations with people at the Arizona State University, Bruce Rickman is the name there, who works in algae culturing big time. And we are lucky to be f uh, supported by JWOPS, uh, Jamil Abdul Latif uh, Food and Water Security uh, Initiative. And they gave us trust and funding to work with one of my students, Joseph Sand to demonstrate the concept, demonstrate that we can manage light, and also demonstrate that we can uh, bring gas into algae cultures. So Joseph is right now rigging a setup that we can hopefully dump in an algae reactor and then see how much more efficient we can potentially create uh, biomass. And if it works, uh, this is only one problem that has to be solved, but maybe in, 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 the, in the near to midterm future, algae might become more of a stable in the uh, biomass generation approach uh, for fuel for feed, definitely, and maybe even for food for people. So there's been different initiatives from the biotechnologist offices um, that are looking at uh, optimizing algae from a genetic point of view, optimizing the manufacture of an infrastructure for algae, and scaling this. Uh, there's different sort of efforts across different countries of, of scaling the manufacture. There's huge raceways and algae ports, photovirectors, so it's big. It's a big um, sort of endeavor since a couple of decades, I should say. Um, but that light, Management problem is still a persistent one. And I think if, if we find on lab scale a solution that we can show, okay, we get light deeper into, let's say, a meter deep culture, most cultures at the moment are about six centimeters, um, we, we make a good argument for it. Now, if we then start to integrate this into batch reactor type systems, where we, where we show, okay, this is the amount of fibers that we need, this is the infrastructure that we want, want to have, uh, we're demonstrating this in a slightly larger system. And then we really have to address um, scalability in terms of the simplicity of the components, the, 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 the low price of components, uh, the easy deployment of these structures, and, and also the things like as, as, as simple as bioforming, right? and as complex as bioforming. It's, like it's a good problem, but it's a problem that, that completely buffers people for, for a long time now in many different applications. Uh, there recently, there's a lot of really neat uh, 
research that came out from, from labs at Harvard, John Eisenberg is one, uh, there's one at Penn State, Penn State one, uh, that show that the fluids on surfaces you can, you can prevent biofouling very, very uh, efficiently. And so we're looking into all sorts of different avenues, uh, problems that we have to solve much earlier in my research now. That companies have specific problems in mind that might make or break us with the application. And so, so we're trying to anticipate some of these problems uh, that might hit us in the long term. Um, ahead of time, speak to companies as to how they talk about this and how they think about solving these, and then evaluate whether our approach is, is, is viable. And I also like um, parallel streaming our efforts to some, uh, to some extent. Uh, on the fibers for algae, for example, we are structuring the surface of the algae with laser rustling, but we're also working with a group in the University of Delaware, Lashanda Corley, uh, who has um, electrofiber spin uh, to spin microfibers on top of a guide fiber with varying uh, thickness uh, in the, in the microspun fibers to change the light emission profile. So I think one, one thing that is, that is more and more important in my thinking is, do we use scalable approaches? Do we use approaches that companies would consider scalable and easily implementable in their applications?